This is the uh, first uh, session uh, of this track, and then uh, we are going to discuss uh, different type of architecture patterns uh, throughout the day. Uh, so uh, that's the idea. I think uh, you had a, a very productive day yesterday, and uh, uh, enjoy the party as well. I know that Ram is a little bit strong. Uh, so yes, uh, to start with, I thought of um, go through some uh, theory because there are students participating for the uh, conference as well. Uh, so the uh, architecture, basically, if we look at uh, architecture, um, it's, it's talk about the structure of components that uh, we need to build uh, some uh, thing and the interrelationships among uh, these uh, different components. So that's what we call as architecture in general. Then uh, specifically when it comes to software architecture, same principles apply with uh, software systems and then subsystems that we define this stuff at the initial stage and then take it through uh, the uh, development or the implementation stages. So as an example, uh, high level breakdown. So this is uh, architecture diagram of uh, IoT platform. Uh, so if you look at uh, what required to build the IoT platform represent in this diagram in different layers uh, or different components like uh, the connectivity and then API management, security, so and so forth. So that's a good example about how we define a software architecture. Then the topic today is not about uh, software architecture, it's about the iterative architecture. Uh, so I took this slide from yesterday because I did a session uh, in the strategy track about, um, uh, about uh, building a platform uh, for uh, the digital transformation. So this uh, was the slide that I used yesterday to show like how an iterative architecture looks like that you start it from a prototype and then gradually build it to uh, till you reach the um, end result, but then again, there's no such end that you will keep on improving the uh, system or the application that you are building. So in real world, I think this is a really good example. I think everybody is familiar with this uh, major project, um, Hubble, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the telescope that uh, they built. So basically, the idea started around 1990, and then if you look at the picture, you can see like how the, um, uh, the, uh, the component improves uh, with the time, and then uh, the things around the uh, component, uh, again, improve. So that's a really good way, because uh, uh, a project like this, uh, it's limited um, uh, changes that you can make if you don't design at the uh, first level, a prototype level, or the first release that uh, they have done. So uh, it gradually increased, and then now we have a really good product um, uh, up in the sky. So that's a real world example of a good iterative architecture that we can take. Then in software, there are different type of uh, ways to apply um, uh, iterative architecture. Most common and um, uh, recommended way is Scrum as a methodology that we can use to uh, improve or implement iterative architecture. Uh, so um, uh, we can use the same principles in the development stage as well. Addition to Scrum, um, uh, if you look at the uh, iterative architecture process, that the same principle that we apply for uh, the iterative development applies here, that you will build uh, one model or design one model and then keep on adding or improving the stuff. Uh, and, but the only um, uh, thing that I need to highlight, each and every release is a workable model. Uh, that's what, uh, as an architect, you have to keep it in your mind. So addition to Scrum, there's a nice um, uh, framework called uh, SAFE, or Scale Agile Framework, that uh, gives you, um, uh, the Scrum is basically about the implementation side of uh, the iterative development. So uh, how you apply the architecture principles and then make it uh, iterative comes with the Scale Agile Framework. A lot of uh, architects are using this and then um, uh, kind of a recommended approach as well. So the, uh, in practice, uh, before you apply the iterative nature to the architecture, you have to define the architecture. So this is a process that we uh, apply with 
any project that we are doing. So first thing is to get the requirements, so that we call as the business architecture, and then uh, look at the current applications and systems available in that particular organization or the uh, deployment. And then identify the missing parts, or what we call as delta, uh, what need to be added to that uh, particular system. So that's the first step that we are doing. In the second step, uh, um, how you build this architecture, the first requirement side, we call it as a business architecture. Uh, earlier days, we call it as kind of the system design, but uh, now we call it as a system business architecture. And then people who's building that call business architects. So we call them uh, earlier as a business analyst, but uh, in current world, uh, that role doesn't exist. Uh, we call them as business architects who uh, got uh, some technical knowledge as well as uh, business knowledge, uh, who can document something uh, that the architect and the, the development team can take and build an um, application or a system. Then the second level, uh, we call it as a solutions architecture. Uh, based on the business architecture, how you design the solution. And um, when we do that, we do it in, uh, in two levels. First, we call as level zero. Uh, basically, level zero uh, is a component diagram. I'll show you an example uh, in the next slide. Uh, so it's basically a component diagram that doesn't uh, describe any product or a vendor or um, uh, it's not a detail level design, it's a really high level design. Then the level one, we map all the existing systems and the new applications or new uh, vendor products that you are bringing into the, uh, your new architecture that call the level one architecture. Then after you finish the solutions architecture, you are going into a, uh, the next level called application architecture. That's where you uh, define uh, things like what are the integration patterns that you should use, and then uh, what are the data models that you use, and if there are any APIs involved, because most of the projects that we are doing are API enabled, so what are the APIs that you are going to expose through the, um, your system? So that's called the application architecture. Then the third, fourth step is uh, define your runtime architecture. Now you um, have a system built, how it's going to run in a specific data center or a cloud environment, uh, so and so forth. So during that exercise, uh, what we do, we uh, are doing a capacity planning uh, based on uh, different type of parameters like throughput, latency that uh, you are expecting from the system, um, and then uh, how complex your business processes, uh, so and so forth, that you will uh, define some set of parameters and then doing a, a capacity planning exercise. So we have a session in the afternoon uh, about capacity planning. If you come to that session, you will identify how you do a capacity planning uh, in your systems. Then the uh, next thing about the deployment, like how uh, uh, this system going to be deployed. Are you going to use a virtualized system? Are you uh, going to use a, a container-based system? Uh, so what type of a deployment uh, environment that you are having? As well as uh, identify what are the policies and then any kind of limitations that you have in your uh, deployment, target deployment environment, because this is a step that we didn't do in the um, initial architecture uh, exercises, that we develop something and then we identify all the issues when we try to uh, deploy it and then having a lot of um, issues with uh, DevOps teams. But today it's not like that. DevOps is kind of a friend of the development team. They um, uh, join the development team from day one and help to um, uh, get their requirement as well as uh, uh, contribute to the architecture from day one. Then the last thing uh, we are doing about security, like we define a security architecture based on uh, the organization policies and then the security standards that we are going to use. So we have a session, uh, Shankar uh, will be doing a session on what are the security architecture patterns uh, that are available and then how you can apply them into your architecture as well. So those are the uh, four steps usually we do uh, during an architecture. It can vary on the complexity of the process, but in general, this is what we do. So this is an example for level zero and level one architecture that I uh, described earlier. So if you can see the uh, diagram in your uh, 
uh, right hand side. Uh, so it describes a level zero architecture. So this is a reference architecture for a pattern called MDM. MDM stands for Master Data Management. Uh, how a MDM system looks like. So you can find different type of uh, architecture layers as well as components on top of your uh, data layer. And in the um, other side, you see the um, uh, product mapping that is called the level one architecture, how you implement using uh, these products. So uh, to uh, take you through an example of how you can uh, build a iterative architecture, as this is a common uh, uh, diagram that I use frequently. So if you walk to enterprise, uh, it uh, enterprises look like this. Like you will see a lot of uh, set of services, and then you will see set of legacy applications, and then you will see multiple data repositories. And then top of that, you will see nicely built um, web apps, mobile apps, desktop applications that consume da this data and uh, processes. But in the middle, it's kind of a real mess that uh, based on different type of integration technologies, uh, different type of integration patterns, you will see a kind of a real mess that integrate this data and processes to provide uh, information to the uh, delivery channels that you see at the top. So most of our uh, projects are based on to help uh, users or customers to uh, resolve this mess and then have a nice architecture. So our iterative approach or the recommended iterative approach to start from the security because most of the organizations, uh, they have um, complex security um, requirements, as well as uh, most of the organizations, they have multiple user stores, like uh, internal user store, external user store, uh, so and so forth. So how to have a proper uh, uh, identity management system, and then uh, look at what are the existing security protocols that we are using, as well as what are the new security protocols. Like, as an example, um, uh, most of the organizations, they write uh, services, uh, they wrote services using uh, different technologies like um, uh, Microsoft WCF, uh, Java, J2E, those type of technologies. So those things inherited different uh, security requirements, like Kerberos, uh, WS security, uh, like that. But modern security requirements requirements are different, that most of the uh, modern stuff are on top of OAuth or SAML, that type of standard. So how you can um, build and uh, provide security as a service is the first step that we uh, recommend for most of the organizations to resolve that problem. Then the second step in this uh, exercise um, uh, to uh, get your services clean uh, so you might have existing services, and uh, uh, if you want to uh, get your data quickly as a service, then you can uh, in, like, uh, bring data services into the picture. And if you are writing uh, new services, then we ha have an application server that you can use different standards like JAX-WS, JAX-RS, um, uh, PO Java objects, like those type of different service writing standards. And um, uh, then uh, uh, use the application server runtime to write service. And we introduce a new uh, service writing runtime and a framework called Microservices Framework for Java. If you are interested in uh, writing services as a microservice, then you can use that as well. So the second step is to get your services clean. Then the uh, third step, now you have a set of services, but you need a way to find what are the services available and how you can access this. So uh, the third step is bring the governance into the picture. Uh, so as a product uh, or a framework, we have governance um, registry that you can uh, use it as a um, uh, framework to uh, register or catalog all your services in your uh, deployment. Then the next step is like uh, that uh, resolve that integration mess, uh, bring a proper mediation or integration layer that uh, uh, as a product you can use the enterprise service bus and uh, do the internal connectivity using the ESB. So you can't just survive by connecting internal stuff, you need to go and connect with 
the outside world. Like if you are using uh, like uh, any SaaS products like Salesforce, Workday, and social stuff like Facebook, Twitter, then you can uh, use the same runtime using this uh, architecture called Connect architecture, uh, connect to the outside world, and then consume this data in a secure way. Uh, so once you have your internal and external connectivity, now you need a proper way to expose your services. So today we uh, call services are the implementation, but services are not consumable. So uh, the, how you consume the services, basically uh, using the API management or the API layer. So to build, bring an API into your architecture, you can put an API management layer on top of your integration layer. So now you have your security done, you have your uh, services done, uh, you have a governance registry to catalog this stuff, and um, with the, uh, you have the internal um, integration done and external integration done, and with the API management, you have API and uh, some governance on top of API as well. So we don't call it as API registry, we call it as a API store that, uh, that uh, catalog all your APIs. So uh, you can't just survive with one integration pattern. That's where like, uh, you might need uh, publish and subscribe or eventing. And then uh, you might need to implement workflows. So you can bring uh, runtimes like message broker, uh, then uh, business activity monitor into the picture, and then even extend, like especially if you are using eventing, you might need to filter the events. Then you can bring things like a complex event processor. And the uh, monitoring is another key uh, feature because uh, if, you, if you are using the API management, uh, you need to know who's invoking these uh, APIs so you can bring monitoring using a runtime like uh, data uh, analytics server. Then you can fill the blanks by bringing various other runtimes in the picture, like uh, bring uh, a store and um, uh, bring like business rules. Like that, uh, based on your project requirements, you can bring all these additional products into the same architecture and uh, fill the blanks. So th when you are doing uh, this architecture, usually uh, like first uh, will first step or the first version will provide the basic stuff. And then next level will provide, like uh, uh, based on the user requirements, things like uh, user workflows, uh, so on and so forth. And then uh, the third level, uh, it brings uh, things, uh, value additions into the current system, and then uh, keep on improving with your customer feedback. So that's what we see uh, in most of the systems. So one advice when uh, you are doing uh, this iterative architecture, whatever the iterations that you are releasing should be meaningful as well as should bring some kind of value into the business. So that's where you need to carefully design what each and every um, iteration looks like. So uh, we internally use this term called MVP or the most uh, viable product. That's the first version and then uh, keep on add, adding features into the MVP by looking at what's the customer demand as well as um, as a product, what, what are the features that we should um, uh, provide or uh, release with that particular project. So a uh, few examples of um, how our customers um, um, or the users implement this iterative architecture. I will take uh, uh, one example from the healthcare industry. So this uh, California-based healthcare um, uh, uh, company called Kaiser Permanente, so they started actually uh, uh, bringing their legacy stuff into services first, and then uh, they got the uh, integration layer done after that. And uh, they started building a mobile application. They identify API management required. Then they introduce the API management. And um, uh, like that, they uh, got different products at a different level based on the business requirement. And then again, another example, uh, the West uh, Corporation, I think yesterday Sanjeev uh, explained about what they are doing. So they, again, uh, started with the integration layer. Uh, they had a services layer already. And they thought of uh, rewrite their services from uh, old uh, .NET stuff into a Java-based thing. So they started rewriting the uh, services parallelly. 
and started routing the traffic from uh, the old services into new services gradually, like started from 10% uh, into 20%, 30%, like that, and then start using the new system uh, and got the services done. Then they had this issue of how they can govern the services and then um, how, you, how they can implement a life cycle into the services. Then uh, they started bringing the governance registry into the picture and uh, define all the services as a life cycle in the, uh, that service model. So like that, most of our customers uh, closely working with us when they architect these systems as well as implement it. So we help them to define what are the um, uh, iterations that required by talking to the technical architects as well as business architects and then help them to um, um, define it and then make sure they deliver on time as well as um, have a proper iterative approach. Um, I'm not sure the time is correct, uh, so uh, that's all I have uh, put together. If you have any questions, I am happy to answer any questions. <laughs>